Okay. Who wants to share? What is something that you are hopeful for for next year? You don't have to raise your hand, just shout it out. What are you most hopeful for for next year? Anybody? Keep getting better with health. Yes, we've had that in both services. Prayer for better health and hoping for better health. What else? What are you hopeful for for next year? Children coming to the Lord. That's a great one. Yes. What else are you hopeful for for next year? What are you hoping for? All right. I'm not even going to respond to that. It's a trap. What else are you hopeful for next year? <laughs> Salvation of siblings, yes. So children, siblings, and I heard something else. What's that? Surviving cancer, yes. We've had that in both services as well. Hopeful for, for health and, and for um, another year. In the early service, someone said, I'm not ready to go yet. And that, that's... That is something to be hopeful and praying for. What else? What else are you hopeful for for next year? Restoration of relationships. That's a great one. That's really good. Someone in the earlier service said unity in politics, which might be wishful thinking, but that's something to hope for. (laughs) Anything else? What are you hopeful for for next year? What's that? Contentment. Okay, yes. Hoping for contentment, that God will help provide that. There are lots of things that we hope for. And if you think about it, hope is all about waiting, right? Hope means something hasn't happened yet that I want to happen, and so I hope that it happens. Or in some cases, hoping that it happens is not a wishful thinking, but it's actually, I know this is going to happen, and so I'm just waiting for it, and I can't wait for it to happen. Some things are really worth waiting for. Okay, I want you to think about some of these. One of the things that, that I'm surprised no one mentioned is, is for a vacation. Some, some of us really, really hope for a vacation, a good vacation. And even if you're planning a vacation that you've waited for for months and months, as you work up to that, there's an anticipation that builds an excitement of just, oh, I can't wait to go on that vacation. That's going to be awesome. Here's something else that's worth waiting for. For chocolate chip cookies to finish cooking in the oven. <laughs> I know that some of you barbarians like to just scoop it out and eat it out of the tub. I've got to have it baked, okay? Baked chocolate chip cookies are worth waiting for. And this is kind of a funny one. This is worth waiting for if you're a cat for the fishermen to come back to the shore. They're all there watching the boats as they bring the fish in, waiting for them to come back. Of course, it's Christmas time, and that means there's a lot of hope and anticipation around one particular issue. And if you're a kid, you know exactly what I'm talking about, because on December 25th, you're going to rush downstairs, and underneath the tree are going to be what? Presents. And you cannot wait for those presents. And there's that hopeful anticipation and waiting for those presents to be there, because you want to open them up and see what's inside. There are lots of things that we wait for with anticipation, that we hope for, that we're excited about. That's actually what Advent is all about. Advent comes from the Latin for the coming. And so Advent has to do with something that's coming in the future. But did you know that originally Advent, which starts today, by the way, had nothing to do with Christmas? Advent originally had to do with a season of preparation for Christian baptism. It was a time of preparing yourself spiritually for baptism. That's what Advent originally referred to. And then after that, for a long time, Advent referred to a time of preparation in anticipation for the future coming of Jesus. The second coming, not the first, but the second coming of Jesus. That's what Advent was all about for a a large portion of history. And then it became something tied in with the Christmas season. Advent referring to the coming of the Messiah, not the second time, but the first time at his birth, the nativity. All of these three have to do with hopeful waiting with anticipation, with excitement about something that is to come. That's a theme you find throughout the the scriptures, this idea of a hopeful waiting, of of an eager anticipation. You're not even exactly sure what it's going to be like, but you can't wait for it to be there. That's all over the Bible. There's a word for it. It, It's called kava, and kava is a Hebrew word for hope or hopeful waiting. And kava comes from the word kav, which means rope or cord. And what happens when you pull on a cord and you pull it and you pull it and you pull it, there's this tension that's created. And it gets more tense and more tense and more tense until it finally snaps. And then there's a release. 
That tension before the release is called kava. So kav is the cord. Kava is this tension that happens when you know it's going to happen. It's going to happen at some point. You're not necessarily sure when, and you're just sort of waiting for that to happen. That's kava, hopeful, waiting, anticipation, kava. Now the Bible often seems like it's this book full of miracles and adventures and battles and crazy awesome things that God is doing all of the time. But the reality is, if you look closely, the Bible is full of times of waiting. Sometimes waiting for hundreds of years for God to make his next obvious move. There's a lot of waiting in the Bible. Most of the people in the Bible never saw all of the incredible things that we read about today. You ever think about that? If you were to take all of the amazing things that happen in the Bible, and you were to put them on a timeline, or map them out on a map geographically, you would realize that most people did not experience the things that we can read in the Bible today. Because we look back on all of that, but people in that day, 99% of them, never even knew that happened. They lived their life without knowing a lot of what God was doing. But they still had reason to hope. As messed up as their world was, they still had reason to hope. If they were a follower of God, if they had ever been to the the temple, if they had ever heard the prophets read, they had reason to hope. And that's what I want us to explore today, the hope that those people had. We're going to pick up where we left off in Genesis chapter 3. And I'm going to invite you to try to enter into that tension with me, that kava of living two, three thousand plus years ago and waiting for God to deliver on his promises. Promises that you've heard about a few times, promises maybe that someone read to you at the temple, promises that you had no idea how they would be fulfilled. And so there's this tension of not knowing the when, not knowing the how, but still this hope is there, this belief that God is gonna do something to fix this messed up world. What is he gonna do? How is he gonna do it? That's the tension, that's the kava that people wrestled with. Many people devoted their lives to studying these things and trying to figure them out. How would God do this? And so we're gonna be in Genesis chapter three this morning, picking up on where we left off last week. Before we go there, let's just bow our heads and pray and ask God to teach us this morning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning and study it together, I pray that you would help us to have a better understanding of the hope that we can have in you. And I'm struck by the fact that so often I don't live in that hope. I'm so focused on the the issues that I wrestle with and and the challenges of the day that sometimes I forget that in light of what you have done for me and what you have waiting for me, it's kind of insignificant. And yet you still care about it, but you have promised something so much better for the future. So Lord, I pray that as we study your word today, you would help us to have a a new understanding of your hope and, and to understand how you are faithful and true and to be strengthened in our faith, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So if you're in Genesis chapter three, that's where we're gonna start, verse 14. And if you don't have a Bible with you, I recommend the YouVersion Bible app. I, I read the Bible most often in that app and there are great Bible study plans there as well. You can follow along there in Genesis chapter three. Let me just catch you up on where we were last week. Last week we talked about how God created two people, perfect, in a perfect garden, no brokenness, no damaged relationships, nothing bad at all, but he gave them a choice. They could either love God or they could reject God. They could either trust him or they could disobey him. Eve was deceived by Satan and she chose to believe in Satan instead of God. Adam was not deceived, but Adam chose to follow his wife instead of God. And as a result of that, God gave them curses, consequences for their actions. We're just going to look at one of those today. There are three curses. One is to the serpent, one is to Adam, and one is to Eve. We're going to look at the one to the serpent today. This is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, that's tempted Eve to sin, you are cursed more than all animals domestic and wild. 
You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Now, here's the the one I really want to get to today. This is verse 15. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, imagine with me for a minute that you are Adam or Eve hearing this for the first time. This is very confusing. What does this mean exactly? There's going to be hostility between your offspring and his offspring, and then it gets really specific, like an individual person, two individual people. He will strike your head. You will strike his heel. What does any of that mean? It must have been incredibly confusing for them. Two hits will be landed. One will be on the heel. It will be painful, but not lethal. The other one will be a strike to the head. It'll be a critical blow, a finishing blow, and will end the serpent. But who is this other he that God is talking about? Who's the he that will strike the head of the serpent, Satan? That must have been incredibly mysterious to them. But it gives us our first glimpse of what God was promising for the future, hope. A reason to believe that God was going to somehow fix what they just messed up. That God had a plan for this broken world that they had just played a part in breaking. That he would somehow free them from whatever that thing was that just led them into sin. God was going to create a way for that thing to go away and for them to not be bothered by it in the future. But how was he going to do that? It must have been as mysterious and vague to them as end times prophecies are to us now, where we can study it for a lifetime and come up with all kinds of theories, and yet we still don't exactly know how is God going to bring this about. So throughout the Old Testament, what we have are many, many clues as to who this he would be. Who was this person who would strike the head of Satan? and would free people from the bondage they have to sin. Who was this person? The prophets would go on to give many, many words from God about who this would be. And over the thousands of years, you can piece these together to start to get a picture of what this individual would would come to look like, where he would come from, how things would come about. They started calling him the Messiah or the Anointed One. This was someone who was going to be special from God, was going to come and rescue his people. But what did they know about the Messiah back then? From this initial prophecy given directly from God in Genesis chapter 3, we learn right away that this individual will be wounded in some way. His heel will be struck by Satan, but it won't be a critical blow. And so then he will deliver the finishing blow to Satan. So that's the first thing we learn about the Messiah, is that the Messiah will defeat Satan. And for a long time, that's their only major clue. There are other things here and there that you can draw from, and we're not going to dive into everything we could look at today. But then we get to this guy named Jacob, also called Israel. Jacob was nearing the end of his life. He had 12 sons that he brought to him to bless them. And he prophesied over them. And so he actually spoke words from God about what would happen to their families in the future. These families that would grow into huge tribes within the nation of Israel. And he brought them in. And for one son, he gave a very special blessing. Now, you would think that this blessing might go to the oldest. That would be Reuben. But he did not get the special blessing. Or maybe it might go to Joseph. You remember Joseph, the guy who was the second youngest son of Jacob, went over to Egypt as a slave, ended up becoming second in command of all of Egypt. An incredible story. Saved his family from starvation and brought them in and gave them some prosperity in Egypt. But it wasn't Joseph. It was actually a different son named Judah. And and Jacob prophesied over Judah. He said, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Judah, you're not the oldest, but your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. In other words, when people come to fight against you, you'll get the upper hand on them. All of your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? And this is really interesting. The scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs. The one whom all nations 
will honor. Now that is a very unique blessing. One of Judah's descendants, not Reuben's or Joseph's, will be a ruler, and he'll have many, many generations of great rulers, Jacob says, but eventually it's going to come down to one who actually owns the authority, who, who belongs to have all of that authority, and all of the nations will honor him. Imagine if you were told that you will have many generations of great leaders in your family, your children and your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. They'll all be incredible leaders. And then at one point, you'll have one that will rise to such prominence that every single nation in the world will gather to honor them. Isn't that an incredible prophecy? I mean, some of you would just settle for next year, your kid will move out of the house. But this is, you're going to have a great, 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 great grandchild that all the nations are going to honor. That's an amazing prophecy. And we learn from this that the Messiah will be a ruler. There's one that the scepter will come to from the tribe of Judah who will be a great ruler. Fast forward with me now to the days of Moses. Moses is about to send the tribes of Israel that we just talked about from those brothers into their promised land. But he has been told by God he cannot go in. And so he's giving final instructions to the people before they go into the promised land. And he tells them, the place that you are going has some awful practices. They do some terrible, terrible things. Um, I, I won't even mention the things that he says that they do. But he says, you are not to do what they do. It is, it is despicable. And then he says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. No doubt the people were worried. This had been their leader that they had followed, and they're wondering, what's going to happen in the future? What are we going to do? And Moses says, he prophesies, the Lord will raise up a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And then he says, this is God speaking here, I will personally deal with anyone who will not listen to the messages the prophet proclaims on my behalf. Now, many prophets would come and go in Israel's history, and not all of them were well listened to. But this was one where God said, I will personally deal with anyone who doesn't listen to him. This was not an ordinary prophet. This was something special. This was a reference to the Messiah. And so we learn from this that the Messiah will be a prophet 700 years later. Isaiah, the prophet, is writing about the future of Israel. He gives Israel warnings and promises to pass on to their children. He predicts that God is going to use foreign armies to teach Israel a lesson. And that's exactly what happens. And then he says this. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. I want you to notice that last phrase. Whoever believes need never be shaken. And here's why. We don't have time to get into the linguistics behind it. But the old Greek translation of this is, whoever believes in him need not be disgraced or not be ashamed. That's a Greek translation of this that existed at least 150 years prior to Jesus being born. And so already by the time of Jesus, there was an understanding, and we don't know exactly how they understood this in the days of Isaiah, but probably as well, there was an understanding that the cornerstone here did not refer to a literal stone. It referred to a person. In fact, when this verse is quoted in Romans 9 and in 1 Peter 2, it's quoted as, whoever believes in him need never be disgraced or ashamed or or shaken. And so it was probably well understood by people in Isaiah's day that this cornerstone referred to a person. In fact, David actually wrote about the cornerstone a lot as if it were a person. One of the things he said was that the stone the builders had rejected has now become the cornerstone. He also talked about the cornerstone being a stumbling block for Israel. And so this was kind of understood prophetic language that this referred to the Messiah. So the Messiah will be a cornerstone. Around the same time that Isaiah prophesied, another prophet named Micah was on the scene and he prophesied as well. He prophesied about where the Messiah would come from. This is from Micah chapter five. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among the people of Judah. That's important. This is, this is from the tribe of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, 
whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. Already this should be giving them chills. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land. And he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed for he will be highly honored around the world. Now you can see the amazing similarities that are in this prophecy to what you and I know about the Messiah and to the other prophecies that we've already covered. All the nations will honor him. He says some other interesting things here too as well. The Messiah will come from the people of Israel, from the tribe of Judah, but his origins are in the distant past. That's very interesting. And one of the signs of his coming is a woman giving birth. Now imagine if you are the people listening to Micah, hearing this message about a future Messiah and thinking, okay, so we're just supposed to pay attention for when somebody's in labor. Anytime somebody's in labor, it could be that somehow the Messiah is coming. You know, what would they make of this? What did that even mean to them? Very confusing. And then he says something very specific about the geography of the Messiah. He will come from the tiny village of Bethlehem. The Messiah will come from Bethlehem. What, a, what an interesting and very specific prophecy to make. There are many, many more that we could talk about. There's at least 65 other pretty direct references, prophetic references in the Old Testament to the Messiah. And hundreds of more indirect references that you can look back and see the connections to. My goal this morning was to give you a little sample of what the Old Testament scriptures have to say about the future Messiah, the promised hope that God had to redeem the world. Some of the more obvious ones that they would have looked at back then and gone, that refers to the Messiah, but what does it mean? I want to share one more with you. This is from Zechariah 9. He says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding a donkey's colt. So Zechariah is writing about a couple hundred years after Isaiah and Micah. And this was his prophecy. The people of Israel should expect a, a king, a victorious and righteous king, but he will also be humble. Humble enough to ride on the colt of a a donkey, a foal. Not on a mighty horse like rulers normally would ride. So this this is the type of Messiah the people of Israel should look for. A Messiah who will be a humble king who would ride on a little donkey. So do me a favor. Just take a look at that list. Understand that this is a fraction of the prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament. I'm just a fraction. I just, I just kind of picked out six of them that I thought were really cool. There's way more in there. This is what the people had to go on. Little clues here and there about what the Messiah might be like given to them from the prophets that maybe they heard at temple one day as someone was reading the, the prophets aloud. And they wondered, how on earth is God going to bring all this together? So many different weird specific things that have to happen to pull this all together. How's God going to do it? In the meantime, these people had lives. They had jobs. They had hobbies. They grew up. They, they had kids. They faced adversity. They wrestled with the same types of things that you and I struggle with. And all the while wondering, how is God going to bring about some resolution to this? What is he going to do? We've, we've heard these promises. What is he going to do to fulfill all of this? They could have hope. Hope that God wasn't finished. Hope that he still had a plan. That something good was coming for the universe still. I think there's something really neat about looking back from our vantage point thousands of years in the future from some of these and looking back and seeing them from our perspective. But recognize they didn't have that perspective. Understand the tension that they faced and the uncertainty of the future, but the hope that God was going to do something incredible. They looked forward to a time that you and I now get to look back to. And so the question then is, was it worth the wait? 
Was it worth the wait? All of these clues, did they ever lead anywhere? What happened with all of these? And that's where we get to Jesus. Jesus actually talked about these prophecies multiple times. In John chapter 5, he says, you search the scriptures. He's speaking to religious leaders here. He says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. He's saying the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, they all point to me. I am the source. I am the Messiah. I am the deliverer that you've been looking for, and yet you refuse to come to me. Later on, Jesus After he has died and come back to life, he's walking on a road to Emmaus with a couple of people, and they don't recognize him. They get to talking about the Old Testament scriptures and the prophecies and things concerning the Messiah. And here's what happens. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses, which we've covered some of those today, and the prophets, which we've covered some of those today, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, this is a bold claim. This is a bold claim that Jesus was making. And maybe we can't fully grapple with that. We can't fully understand that in that culture, for someone to come along and say, yeah, all of those dozens and dozens of prophecies from from our long history, they all point to me. That's a big deal. And yet that's exactly what Jesus was saying. And this is why C.S. Lewis said, you, when you come to Jesus, you, you either have to call him a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Those are your options because of what he claimed to be. It's incredible. And so then the question is, did he actually fulfill these prophecies? When we look at the life of Jesus and what we know about Jesus from all these many records that we have and all the tens of thousands of manuscripts that go back to uh, talking about the life of Jesus, what do they reveal in relation to these scriptures that supposedly point to him? Let me just show you a few of them. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus tells his disciples, go into the village over there As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. This took place, Matthew says, to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Prophecy fulfilled. In Luke chapter 2, Luke says, at that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby, Jesus, to be born. Another prophecy fulfilled. Peter writes, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. Remember, David talked about how the cornerstone would be rejected. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. That comes from Isaiah. Prophecy fulfilled. Acts chapter 3, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise you up, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. Imagine hearing those words. Every prophet from our past spoke about, prophesied about what's happening right now. It's incredible. When God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you, people of Israel, to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. Another prophecy fulfilled. Revelation chapter 5. But one of the 24 elders said to me, this is John speaking, uh, but one of the elders speaking to John says, stop weeping, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne. He has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Just as the prophecy from long ago predicted. 
And then later on in the same book, Jesus is speaking. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. More prophecies fulfilled. From the line of David, from the line of Judah, an heir to the throne, the one to whom the scepter comes, who who it belongs to, who all nations will honor him, and yet his origins are in the distant past. I am both the source of David and the heir to David's throne. More prophecy fulfilled. Hebrews chapter 2 says, what we do see is Jesus, who for a little while was given a position a little lower than the angels, that's one of us, and because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone, because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood. The Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could, could he die And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. That text there, the power of the devil, literally the the original words refer to destroying the devil. Abolishing the devil. That's what the word literally means. Abolish, wipe out, destroy the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at this list when I, this is just a, less than a tenth of the very clear prophecies that we see fulfilled by Jesus. When I look at this, I can't help but have my, my faith strengthened. And what it tells me is that our God is a God who keeps his promises. Our God is a God who is faithful and trustworthy. I'm reminded of the fact that I don't serve a Savior who was just a really good guy who said some good things that one time and people wrote it down and passed it on. There is so much Old Testament scripture that prophesies about what Jesus would do. Now, it's been thought in the past at times that maybe these old scriptures were actually written after the time of Jesus in ways that would create some some connections that would point to him so that it would sort of build a backstory. You know, build a backstory of Jesus where it looks like all these prophecies are there. The only problem with that is, within the last hundred years, so many manuscripts have been discovered of these old passages dating back to hundreds of years before Jesus was born. We now know, without any question, historically, that these prophecies were written hundreds of years before Jesus came. And yet, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy was fulfilled in a miraculous way by Jesus. This tells us that our God is faithful. It tells us that he is trustworthy. That he has a plan for this universe and to rescue the people who rejected him. He allowed for periods of waiting Hopeful waiting, anticipation, until the time was just right, until the Greek language had become near universal so the message could spread everywhere, until the Romans had built all their roads so that missionaries could travel easily to different corners of the globe and bring the message of the Messiah to all sorts of people. There had never been a time before in the history of the world where those things lined up so just perfectly. Because this Messiah would not just come as a military conquering hero who would go about imposing his will on people through might. The Messiah would come to redeem people's souls, to bring a message of love and forgiveness and hope. And at just the right time, just the right time, God sent Jesus to fulfill all of these prophecies. In fact, Galatians tells us, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, which remember was prophesied, the offspring of Eve, not Adam, born of a woman, to redeem us back to himself. This is how we know that Jesus is the Messiah. This is how we know that he is the hope God promised. He checks all the boxes. This is what God predicted to Adam and Eve and Moses and Jacob, Isaiah, Zechariah, Micah, and so many others. This is what Jesus fulfilled. So here's the question for us now. What are we going to do with this information? What are you going to do 
now that you know that Jesus fulfilled all of this? I have a couple of thoughts. If you're already a follower of Jesus, my hope is that this is incredibly encouraging to you, that it strengthens your faith in him. I know that there are a lot of difficult things we are facing right now. Struggles in our personal lives, struggles with our health, struggles with our mental health, struggles with our families, struggles in our country and in our communities, and a lot of things that seem like very big deals to us. And I'm not saying they aren't big deals. But when we look at the scope of history and how God is working and has been planning every step of the way and put ourselves inside that timeline, we cannot help but gain some perspective on what God is doing in this world and realize that he is planning something that is way beyond our comprehension. Just like it was for them thousands of years ago. They could never have dreamed exactly how God would have carried out all these prophecies and yet we now look back 2,000 years removed from that actually happening and go, that's amazing. Every single box checked. Everything is said the Messiah would do. Jesus did. That's incredible. And of course, that's what they did back then in Jesus' day. The disciples looked at this and said, this this is the Messiah. He checks all the boxes. So we now, as followers of Jesus today, look back to what people way back then were looking forward to, and it should give us hope. It should make us encouraged to see that God follows through on what he says he will do. And so whatever challenge you're facing today, whatever difficulty, whatever struggle is going on in your life, I hope that what we've talked about today will help you to see things in light of what God is doing, the big picture, and how he has a hope and a better future for you in eternity. Now, it's possible, too, that you are not a follower of Jesus right now. And if that's the case, my hope for you is that this will take away one of the objections that you have had for trusting in him. Because there's a lot of misinformation out there that says the Bible is full of inconsistencies and can't possibly be true. That says there's no way Jesus really was the Messiah, the Son of God. There's no way any of this stuff really happened. When you take the time to study it carefully, what you'll find is incredible cross-referencing and completion of prophecy, and fulfillment of everything that God said about Jesus. It is so incredible, it is so miraculous, that you have to walk away and say, there is something to this Jesus. And so my hope for you is that you would trust in him today. That you would believe in what he has done for you. He died on a cross Hebrews said, we read the passage earlier, that he had to become like us as a human so that he could die because only through death could he take away the penalty for our sin. Could he redeem us? And so that's what he did. He did that for you, but then he rose back to life. And when he did, he conquered sin and death. He conquered Satan. He delivered a crushing blow to the enemy who wants to keep us from God. And if that's the Jesus that you want to believe in, to trust in today. Don't wait. Give your life to him. There will be people up here at the end of the service. If you want to talk to someone, to ask any questions, or for them to pray with you. And if you're believing in Jesus today and trusting in him, my encouragement to you is don't keep quiet about it. Tell somebody. Could be someone sitting next to you, could be someone up here, could be me, could be someone at the doors. But you need to get with someone who is also a follower of Jesus, and they're not hard to find in this room, and make sure that you are growing in your relationship with him. Let's pray, and then we're going to take communion together to celebrate the hope that we have in Jesus. Jesus, you've given us such an incredible gift of hope, and it's amazing when we look back at your word to see how you have fulfilled prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. God, thank you for leaving so many clues for us that we could reference and look back to and validate and see the authenticity of your plan and of Jesus as the Messiah. Help us to truly appreciate that, Lord, and to understand what you've done for us. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.